Creating, writing, and running a television show is no joke. And today we sit down with seven of television's most influential and hilarious brains to find out just exactly what goes into pulling off one of the craziest jobs in show business. On this episode, we have Chuck Lorre, executive producer of Two and a Half Men, Mom, The Big Bang Theory, and Mike and Molly. Armando Iannucci, executive producer of Veep. Jenny Connor, executive producer of Girls. Mike Judge, executive producer of Silicon Valley. Mike Shore, executive producer of Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Parks and Recreation. Mark Marin, executive producer of Marin. And Genji Cohan, executive producer of Orange is the New Black. Welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Roundtables, the comedy showrunners. Hi everyone, welcome to the Hollywood Reporter Emmy Roundtables, the comedy showrunners. I'm Stacey Wilson. I'm Lacey Rose. And with us we have Mark Marin, Genji Cohan, Armando Iannucci, Chuck Lorre, Jenny Connor, Mike Judge, and Mike Schur. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. So, I guess Chuck's shows notwithstanding, we seem to be in the sort of golden age of niche comedy. If these shows are not sort of aimed at the masses in the way they once were, and I'm curious if you guys think that trend is good or bad for the genre. It's great for me. Um, <laughs> I don't think I would have had a shot even five or six years ago to go in and pitch a show where it's like you know I interview people in my garage, and at, at that time they'd be like, "That's ridiculous," but now it's possible. So uh, for me to be able to work with something, uh, someone like IFC and to be able to do my show at all and have it find an audience, I, it just wouldn't have happened at another time. I'm not saying it's a huge audience, uh, but it's a good audience. And you know, I think I'm here primarily to hear what it's like to produce a show with money. <laughs> um, but for me, it was a. Uh, it's never a, enough. Money. There's never enough money I'm not ever. Sure I'm show. <laughs> <laughs> but it's. Uh, I think it's great because it really because of the way technology is. We all have an opportunity to find our audience, and they're out there. You just don't know it until you can put something out now. Chuck? Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about niche audiences? <laughs> That's what gets you canceled on CBS. You know? <laughs> you know? That's 13 and out. I mean, we're in the golden age of niche viewing anyway, aren't we? Yeah. Isn't that what people are doing? Uh, although I think some of the smaller networks I actually see their aim to try and grow and grow and grow. So Netflix and HBO are all about actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger and, and sort of meeting the network somewhere in the middle now. And also just getting any traction at all because when you're on the dial like IFC mm -hmm. where a lot of people are like, you know, my mother or even my father, you know, they're like, do I get that? And I'm like, I, I don't know. You have to check your cable. <laughs> so in order to really surface and have, you know, people even aware of the show, um, they put my first season on Netflix and that there were just thousands of people that were like, I had no idea, one, who I was or that, you know, that the show even existed. So if you use enough of these avenues, it raises the profile of the network and also just you, there's a lot of ways to get the show out there. Like you have, I mean, you have two shows on two different broadcast networks, which are utterly beloved, but they don't have the kind of audiences that five years ago would have lasted. And, and now it seems, <laughs> in, in so many ways, they're embraced. Yeah, I mean, there's also this weird thing where the way that ratings are reported uh, on broadcast and cable networks, if, excuse if me, are, are very silly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. If unless they're like put in a vault somewhere. Yeah. It's so but it's like the, the, it's... I, this is the case with girls. Is like there's a report that comes out about girls the next day where it's like seven ex, people watched right, girls seven people. last night. Yeah. But then it's like <laughs> I was the way that they. Days. It's not HBO's model, right? They have they they play it and then they play it again and they play it on other stations and they have HBO Go and stuff. And by the time it's done it's like millions five million people or something so there's this weird way that we're all living in this old universe where we at 8 a.m. we get a, a number is sent to us and it's like this is the number of people that watch your show and it's just not true I mean and, and that goes for Big Bang Theory or girls or anything it's like the 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 niche viewing is not it's not just in terms of what people like to watch it's how they watch it and mm -hmm. it's so crazy in my opinion that we still now, anyone reports that number that comes out the next day, it's, it's like, it, first of all, it's depressing. <laughs> it's super depressing. But then it grows over the week, right? Yeah. 
Do you guys remember when there was a phone line you used oh, to yeah. call? Yeah. And they would say what the ratings we were? We did that on the oh, comeback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember yeah. that? On the show, the comeback on HBO, 10 years ago, there was a big scene where Valerie Cherish, Lisa Kudrow's character, like they got went to a diner and like they went to Nate and Al's and called the number and got a, like a rook, like they were calling the like movie phone or yeah. something. Yeah, it was like that. Yeah. And it was like someone's voice and I always felt like you could hear him being disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's yeah. true. <laughs> I was projecting it just, that. I f it feels like, and I know that there's also an issue of how networks monetize ratings, right? So you can't, like, they don't care about anybody who watches it more than three days after it airs, but it feels like the whole, we all need to, like, agree to just wait a while before yeah. to, Aren't to there, even like, get a remote. Several thing. tiers of numbers now? I mean, yeah, I don't even they, understand. Yeah, on NBC, did it... they, there's, lo there's overnights and there's live. Same day, then there's Live Plus 3, there's Live Plus 7, they do Live Plus 30 now. Like, you get reports now from, from like, your, the episodes that aired in October. It's like, this is how many yeah. people have watched it. It's crazy. With HBO, it's like they want to know how many over the month have watched it. Right. And it could be oh, four yeah. times as much as the open you know, I get, so. we are pleased or we are very pleased. That's it. That's it? You don't even see numbers? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. That's like all the schools that went to. It's better than that. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's 70s uh, school, yeah. That's <laughs> it's better than we tried. It's a little <laughs> unnerving. Yeah, exactly. Everybody wins a trophy. Right. <laughs> it's a little unnerving, though, because and it makes, hard to, it makes it hard to negotiate sometimes later, because it's like, I'm a hit, I think. Oh, I, right, because you can't prove anything. Maybe there's there's a spectrum of pleased. There's like yeah. you know, down here, middle You're looking pleased, for pleased. little inflections. Yeah, you, you can't go into the negotiation <laughs> saying, in four months' time, I'll be a hit. That's yeah. right. But how much of it depends on 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 critical feedback, on profile, on... I think on, on HBO, that's yeah. a lot, their right? major Same with IFC. Concern. I mean, I think they're very happy that Game of Thrones is doing the numbers. It, it does. <laughs> um, but, but uh, yeah, I think that, that they're much more interested in... in um, like awards and good reviews and just sort of being cultural conversation in, yeah, yeah. in the culture yeah. and you know Twitter feed yeah are you and, trending and the New York Times writes about us a lot and you know I got that a question matters. now I, I got Netflix to watch House of Cards and I loved it and now that House of Cards is done for the time being what am I doing with Netflix? Oh, you are watching Orange is the You can watch Orange, Orange. Orange. thank you. <laughs> oh, season one on your show. Yeah, yeah. When, you you know what, everything... And I also, Orange, Orange is the New Black is... Thank you, too. I'm on IFC, but they put it up there. Yeah, season one of his show's on IFC right oh. now. Yeah. But it's and on Netflix, so you can watch it. And, oh. yeah. you, you gotta know. just look, like, <laughs> you look notes. around. <laughs> I, I didn't There's know. There's all sorts of stuff all over the place. Chuck, you only have four shows It's lousy with shows. There's a lot of documentaries, like all the 30 by 30 for 30 documentaries, like the Lance the Armstrong Lies on it. Down Periscope with Kelsey Grammer. I think is on And Toby Huss. I own that on Blu-ray. Oh, okay, so you know, Chuck, there's a menu, you can just scroll around and, you know, it'll show you what's on. Let's <laughs> spend the whole time giving Chuck recommendations on what to watch on Netflix. We'll do the Just tutorial like next time. Round table, yeah. But, that, but like, my kids only watch pretty much through, like, Netflix. It's instant gratification or something that yeah. we've done. There's never live TV viewing. It's No, I will pay anything to watch something on iTunes. Like, I, I never, I'm telling really? you. Really? I still watch live. It's I weird. don't. I really don't, and and I'll watch it on HBO Go, but, you know. But I mostly will buy anything, and to me, that price is always worth it. Right. Like <laughs> there's something about my my brain where I, I'll watch live because there's some part of me that thinks like I'm not alone. Like if I watch it, there's oh. a, like I still have something in my mind where there's a the guy going cooler. time to put this up now. Like there's a guy controlling. The programming yeah. and him and I are. He's well, at work. So see, I'm at I work. I want to be alone. <laughs> I'm like, I want to be alone with House of Cards. Oh. Nobody talked to me. But like, I miss the people like are not on the same page. Like they yeah. can't go to work. There's yeah. all this don't spoiler the shields and things. And and the water cooler is a little dead because. Everyone's watching a different pace. But someone said you've got to look at it like a book club. Like the book's been out for a while, yeah, right. and you could have your little club that's watching at the same time. Yeah, yeah. But someone's going to watch it a year from now, and someone's going to have seen all of them before you get to it. It's yeah. also way harder for comedies, I think. There's got to be a statute of limitations like, on spoilers, too. I mean, you know, if it's been out five years. Well, that's the thing. Like, the Good, it, Wife, the big, the good Wife episode that aired the other night, yeah. like, if you watched that show and you didn't watch it live, you're screwed. Yeah. So, but it's not, usually not that not the case with comedies as much. It's a, people don't, generally speaking, get murdered or, or like, get to have huge life events happen that if you aren't watching it live, you'll, it'll ruin your life. Except on Family Guy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but even that, like, when The Simpsons kills someone, you know about it a year early. It's yeah. like, so it's, that's why I think in terms of, like, delayed viewing, like, comedies are getting more screwed than, than dramas are.
I have a follow-up to the um, the niche shows, I think, in forms also. There's the content has also become somewhat niche. And I think about shows that I grew up watching that felt like more socially conscious, I guess. Um, and Bruce Helford was here last year, and he said something that really stuck with me. He said, you know, you don't see people paying bills on TV anymore. You don't see, again, Chuck's shows withstanding. You don't Why see... Why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> you're, the, you're the model from which we draw our inspiration. I'm a dinosaur um, from which you draw your inspiration. <laughs> but I, I think about... It, actually, I think about Mike's show, King of the Hill, which I still watch voraciously in reruns. And I think about that show because it would have made a great live-action show, too. Mm -hmm. the, the, the characters were wonderful. The, the acting was great. The writing was smart. And I feel like that show actually was very reflective of America in a lot of ways. And I look around a lot of the content I'm seeing isn't totally reflective of, I think, who we are. And I'm wondering, what, what do you think, Mike? I mean, obviously, your new show, Silicon Valley, is very niche, too. But, you know, is, is this good or bad I'm that our shows I'm aiming for a huge are... audience with this. So. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, well, I'm sorry. What, I, I could... No, I'm just sort of when a show like King of the Hill, I, I almost feel like that would never be on TV now. Um, and I'm wondering, is, yeah, what well, is, what yeah, do you Yeah, probably think? not. Yeah. You'd have to have nudity or something. <laughs> well, King of the Hill started writing, working on it in 96. Things have definitely changed in that run. But, there, you know, there's still, like, some kind of mainstream shows on... I mean, Big Bang Theory, you could argue, is niche. It's about some nerdy grad students or whatever. But, like, like with the HBO show, I'm not thinking I'm not attempting to be niche with it. I'm not market-driven. When I do stuff, just want it to be good. So I kind of don't think in those terms, and, and uh, that's the way the world is now. Like, HBO was early on kind of wondering, like, what about this makes it HBO, you know, because they've got this brand. I don't know. I wasn't really thinking that way with this show. The weird thing about Niche, too, is that, like, with, like, Mike's show, like, you can, like you said, you can watch King of the Hill throughout your life. There's something comforting about it. Nice. And the other thing about, like, Niche stuff is that people can always discover it. It hasn't been blown out. I mean, like, certainly for me at, you know, at this table, I mean, more, certainly a lot more people don't know me who do, so that when something is niche, it really leaves it available to be discovered for years. Like, yeah, people enjoy that experience yeah. of like, oh, How I did discovered I not know this. About this? Right, right. And that's also universal in the specificity. The more specific mm. you get, the more people can sort of interpret it for themselves. I'm not sure about the whole niche thing, because you know, a lot of the classic comedies are, you know, Sergeant Bilko is about someone in the army, which is not everyone's experience. Yeah. And, you know, and Mary Tyler Moore was in a TV show, working behind the scenes of a TV show, which again is a very particular... Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's all about just trying to make... As you say, no matter how specific it is, as long as the characters and, yeah. the, and the tone are, are, feel universal, feel something you can relate to, I don't, right. I don't really see this thing about being niche, really. Also, our girls do pay bills, or, or, <laughs> or purposely don't, but yeah. they deal That's with true. bills. They do, they yeah, do yeah, yeah. They have to deal with ordinary <laughs> problems. Mike, you just mentioned executives. You guys all are dealing with, to, to varying extents, executives every day. What are, or, or every I week. bet you this guy is. <laughs> <laughs> do you? With the What's exception of Chuck Lorre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is not immune to this. Yeah. No, you're never immune to it. There's always someone somewhere who's frightened. You know? so. What's the thing that they consistently do that sort of frustrates you? Second guess jokes. For me, I mean, I'm, I'm a, like, on this level, it's just sort of the explanation of why something should remain in because it's funny. There's, there's, it's not, you know, they're very, they, IFC was great, and, and I worked with Fox, too, and they were great. But this sort of, like, maybe not quite getting it and then trying to make a case for it and then making a, a compromise about it. Well, there wasn't a lot of fights, but sometimes when you do something and you write something, you're like, this is, how could you not... I mean, how, but then other times you're like, yeah, maybe we didn't have to say the, that. Maybe pussy was not a great choice there. Pussy's always a great choice. <laughs> yeah. Always a good choice. And how much of that, Mark, is, and, and IFC has such a distinct branding, this sort of, like, you know, it is very sort of indie comedy, that, that's the sensibility. How much of those notes inform what they perceive as being, okay, this is off-brand for us, this is not, or is it they just don't get it? No, they, they, they got like, it, you know, and they were, like I said, I, like, I really don't have much experience. This is my first experience producing, writing, acting, and anything. This is, I'm, I'm a newbie. So, 
I was really amazed because, you know, you work with writers that have been around for a while, and they're, they're, they come in ready for warfare. Like, oh, who's going to... And they were, uh, IFC was great. I mean, they were very diplomatic. They're, they're, I don't think that they think in terms of ratings in the same way that a, a bigger network would. And they want to sort of encourage that feeling that, that they're known for. So they, it was all very, it, there was really no fights and there was really, it was all very um, collaborative. So my experience was, was great. But you know, you talk to writers that have been around for 20 years, you're like, oh my God, how did you survive that? And th we just, I didn't have that experience at all. I feel lucky. You know this, that if you fail, no matter if you're a good soldier and take the notes right. or not, yeah. it's your right. failure. Right. Right. Nobody right. steps and went, goes up and says, you know what, I know yeah. the show failed, but they took my notes. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> you Bill, might as well. You might Bill as well. Rosenthal yeah. always says, yeah. uh, make the show you want, they'll cancel you anyway. Yeah, and, 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 and if it succeeds, they'll take credit, and if yeah. it fails, it's your fault. Right. So yeah. you might as well go ahead and do your show and, you know, and, and risk their, their uh, displeasure. And that's the great thing about Niche, too, is that, you know, whatever the decision, you know, when you're dealing with the, the number of viewers that you have, it, you know, it seems like the, the risk is huge and the fear is huge. But when you're working with IFC, I mean, they just want it to be, you know, interesting. They want to, you know, sort of feel like their network. But the risk of losing viewers or something really, you know, shitting the bed in, in a monumental way is, is really limited because their, you know, their viewership is what it is. So you have a little more freedom there and there's less panic. That was my experience. Who at this table has gotten the note, make it funnier? Not for a lot of years. I mean, HBO, it's, right. it's like a dream. I mean, it's oh, yeah. a dream. It's like a, it's like a joke. It's like oh, something no. I don't want to talk to about with other writers I know because it's like, yeah, it, they, they, they have been, they have been so um, generous with us and they have very few notes and when they, you know, people always think like, oh, you know, if they don't have notes, then that's the dream. But in fact, they have notes and they have smart notes. The notes are very constructive. The only time really I ever had a, a kind of difference of opinion over something, and I think it was about something like the title sequences, in the end, they said, it's your show. Yeah, yeah. So they always Although do that. Although subtly, I don't know if this is yeah. the same, subtly, I, is it the case that, you know, with each year, if, if it grows in terms of success, yeah. the more nervous conversations you have with the network about the next one. It's almost like the bigger it becomes, then more is at stake. the more attention right. is focused on I it. I never got to make it funny enough because they don't know if it's a drama or a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and they still don't. And so that affords you a lot of freedom, then. Yeah. And, and sometimes they'd want to kill the jokes because they thought it was a drama and other yeah. times. Is that, was that the case on Weeds, too? Yeah, I, I, I fuck myself at award season every time <laughs> I make a show because it doesn't, they don't fit. They're weird hybrids. And um, yeah, and, and, and Netflix, we've been going back and forth with it. And it's just like, I don't know. I wish there was just a half hour and an hour of material. Right. Let's vote on those characters, <laughs> those really categories. Half hour show. That would be great. <laughs> that would be really I've gotten like it because it's based on me so occasionally there's been like this this feels a little sad and <laughs> <laughs> so so it's not like could you make it funnier but like it's a little heavy and then we have to decide well is that you know necessary because I you, you know when it comes to when we were in the room like you know writing jokes that I didn't think I could say because I got to say all of them versus letting the, the feeling or the emotion you know carry the scene without the fear without the relief of the funny uh, you know, it's scary, right? Well, it's scary, but it's also the right decision to make because, totally. you know, feeling isn't bad. Yeah. I mean, laughter is no, fine. No, no, you need it, and yeah. that's how you get the funny, but yeah. it is a scarier part. Yeah. It, is, it is a scarier part, I think. The biggest fight we ever got in with HBO, and it was hardly, I mean, considering actual fights people have, it was not one, but it was about, like, a cum shot, like a money shot. And, and they, they thought it was really gratuitous. We, like, did a whole obviously like a prop, uh, like a prop thing with a <laughs> injector and a sprayer and a whole thing. Taking all the magic out of it. <laughs> Sorry guys. What did you actually use for the cum? It was like a combination of conditioner, hair conditioner mm -hmm. and something else. I always thought it was that Cetaphil. Right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> um, and so we, and they, they begged us not to do it. And we said, okay, we're not going to do it. It's fine. They said it was gratuitous. And then the next year, we had kind of a story-motivated, emotional money <laughs> shot, uh -huh. right. and they let us keep it. Mm 
So it really felt like we all grew together. <laughs> they literally needed the relief at the end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because it was supposed to be humiliating. To, it, was yeah, to yeah. Be, it was supposed to shame the character and make her feel bad and humiliated. Now you're getting notes saying, can we have more comp? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> used to have that note a lot on yeah. Tom and Greg. <laughs> <laughs> more humiliating. <laughs> yeah. Emotional cum. Um, I would like to know uh, what is the weirdest or worst pitch meeting you've ever been in? where you've been the person pitching, obviously. Mine wasn't in TV. Mine was a movie pitch where I, a, a guy I was writing movies with at the time, and I pitched a, a full-length feature film, and the executive was so bored. He was lying down so hard he was almost upside down. <laughs> That's how I remember it. And at the end of it, he instantly, the second we finished, said, you guys should do this as webisodes for pop.com. <laughs> Which wasn't, and this was 1998 or something. That's like, a real insult Didn't know what back webisodes then. were, didn't know what pop.com was. <laughs> and uh, we were like, okay, thank you. And then like one second later, whatever pop.com was folded. <laughs> and we like felt of like happy vengeance that his, that the, whatever site that was had folded. <laughs> what was this movie about? I have to know. Ah, oh, I don't remember. It probably wasn't worthy of being purchased by a major film studio, but it was just very, very nice rude. It was very rude. I found it rude <laughs> that he was asleep the whole time. My weirdest was with Paul Stamets, who I guess is writing for you now. Yeah, yeah. I, ha I, went, I went out for Larry Sanders, which is probably dating me. <laughs> and I came in, and he was lying on the couch with his hand over his face. And he was sort of asking questions, and we were kind of talking. And then he got up really quickly, and he said, I have to barf. And he ran to the bathroom and he threw up and then he came back and he's like, I took vitamins on an empty stomach. And he laid, which may or may not have been true. Okay, hey, hungover. And he, yes, yeah. And he, he laid back down and he covered his head again and then he went, okay, pitch. <laughs> and like the rest of it was him lying on the couch, like a slightly redolent of vomit, and me trying to pitch Sanders' I'm ideas. I'm gonna give him a really hard time like, about that tomorrow. Yeah, and then I was out. That was that was my first because I'm I'm not used to it because living in London. So when you come all to LA, you do this round of everyone. You know, you you've got half hour here and a half hour there, and I I didn't realize it was that's what happens to everyone who arrives in LA. And uh, a, a British writer who was working on I think on South Park was warning me about what she called um, depressed hyperbole, <laughs> which is when you go into the room and there's a guy there who just goes. We're so excited to meet you. We just, we're a big fan. We love everything you do. And, you know. And, and <laughs> Depressed hyperbole. And then the very right. firm, after the 30 minutes is up, even if you're having a great time, the very firm standing up and throwing you out of the room. <laughs> when I was a, a younger, angrier comic, and I didn't, you know, I fought everything, Bridget Potter took me into, I think, Rick Ludwin's office at NBC. To, uh, to, to pitch a talk show. And I think, it, I'm pretty sure it was Ludwin says, well, what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you want to talk about? I mean, what, what's it? And like, I was in this like socially kind of like, you know, rebellious mode of comedy. And I'm like, you know, everything, abortion, AIDS. <laughs> like that, those are the first two things that came out of my mouth. And so Bridget's sort of like, hey, there's a, you know, and, it, it, and it, it, Ludwin looked like I'd punched him in the stomach, like, and I, and I really couldn't understand it until years later. I'm like, that's what I was, that's where I was at, you know. And, and I realized that is, that is not a TV talk show. <laughs> TV, yeah. I knew a writer who used to start all his pitch meetings by saying he knew where to get Armani wholesale. Like he would not talk about, and then it was his way of warming up the room, and he would tell the story about this place downtown, and you knock three times, and a guy comes and you have espresso and then you look at the suits and he'd start the whole pitch and then by then they were very excited to go shopping and they had had this bonding moment with him and then he'd go into his pitch. Like, <laughs> Mike, are you harboring a, a really bad pitch in your history? I don't have anything as good as these. I mean, I, I almost put a woman to sleep pitching Office Space, the movie I did once, but like I... I that should be sacrilegious. That's no, terrible. I... 
<laughs> that was the first time I ever pitched anything, and then I just said, I'm not going to pitch again. Like, yeah. I've, <laughs> I've been really lucky that I haven't had to pitch a whole lot, because Beavis and Butthead was a short I made in my house, and then it, it became a hit, so I was already kind of like... I, frog, I had a, Frog baseball? Was that yeah. <laughs> I got to see. Yes, that, that was a. Uh, oh. it, it was breathtaking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really Office, Office Space is one of my favorite movies of all time, but it does not seem like a great pitch. Oh no, it's <laughs> horrible. Yeah. Yeah. What was the pitch no, for the, that movie? Well, the only well, I had done a short. The first thing I ever finished animating before uh, Frog Baseball was uh, was called Office Space, and it was the character Milton at his desk and the boss coming and taking the stapler. So. Mm. When I was first going around meeting with people, and it was a woman at Sony, and I didn't even, I wasn't even supposed to pitch. She just kind of, my manager took me in there. She said, do you have any movie ideas? And I was like, oh, okay, this, and then it was just god awful. But, um, <laughs> but then that, that came about because Peter Chernin at Fox had liked that short and said, you know, make a movie. So I didn't have to, I never had to pitch it again, really. Remember those, those animated short festivals that, like, Lemon yeah. would run? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the. You, I forget what oh, it was is called. that where you saw Spike and yeah, something? Spike and Mike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, I, I remember seeing. They sat some... there and and in the middle of this thing was frog baseball, and <laughs> I, laughing my ass off. Oh, and, thanks. And it was just like it just jumped right out and went, "Hello, this is for real." It was mm -hmm. unbelievable. Yeah, it was a very. Uh, it was weird because I was animating. I just animated these things in my house. I lived outside of Dallas, and then I would send them out. So I hadn't even seen them play in front of an audience, no, and then they place they flew crazy. me out there. It was great. To San Diego, and yeah, it was it was really a surreal. But isn't it experience. interesting to think that today you would make that and you'd put it online, and then maybe somebody yeah. would discover it? It sort of takes away a little bit that it was kind of sweet the way that happened for you because it yeah. would probably not happen. You know, it just I mean, I think now. I think the way it, ha it happens, they ha viral sort of happened back then also because people would. You'd get a VHS that yeah. copied a million times. And, South and it, Park, yeah. yeah, South Park. I mean, that's how I saw it was a VHS, you know, a bunch of times. And then, I mean, but there'd be stuff like uh, that preacher Robert Tilton. Oh, the fart yeah. one. The fart one the where, where everybody had a copy of it, that it, and it was just really well done. Or the RV salesman. Yeah, the there's a. Like, yeah, yeah. It was like that fart thing. I remember the first time I saw that. It was only funny because it was Louis. Louis C.K. took me to his apartment at the time, <laughs> and he he went and took this this v, VHS out of a drawer and he put it in, and we watched it and I laughed hysterically, and then he took it out and he went and put it back in the drawer and he goes like, "That's the last time I'm going to watch this for a few months because I wanted to stay funny." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was a they were starting a new show on MTV. This was while we were in the, I don't know second or third season of Beavis and Butthead and. It was horrible. It was called the Grunt Brothers, or Brothers Grunt, and the producer, who's also on Beavis, came in and showed it. We were all eating lunch, the animators, and he played like a 10-minute video of this show, and everyone's kind of like, eh. and then someone goes, "Oh, they Robert Tilton fart tape." I <laughs> put that in there, and it just like <laughs> threw the roof, and and it was just like, well, can't really. How much did we just spend on the Grunt Brothers here? <laughs> your actors to give a fair critique of you, each of you, what would they say? Well, obviously, Mark's lead would be yes. very glowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I... But what about you? What would they say? It depends on who you ask, <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I try really hard. I mean, I, I, I really try hard. I, I think the, whatever, the 22 minutes we get on any given episode, Every minute counts. I don't want to waste a second of it. I want it all to work, which is the recipe for great unhappiness. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that, that's that's the that's the goal every week is to try and make each moment count. Because there's so many reasons to change the channel. There's so many reasons to go elsewhere. So uh, if the show's no good, I mean, if you walk into a restaurant and you get a bad meal, you're not likely to go back. So I think it's the same way as with television now. There's just too many choices, and there was a time when there were three networks, and you could probably coast a little bit because where are you going? Mm -hmm. We got you, yeah. you know. Right. But now, now you can just, you know, God forbid, people could even read, you know. So <laughs> you're done. You know? <laughs> so what do they say about you guys? Well, some of them tell me I'm a calming presence mm. on the set. <laughs> <laughs> I've been feeling that, yeah. um, <laughs> which is nice. 
I mean, it's a very frenetic uh, process we have where we're writing away, but we're always, we rehearse, we do an awful lot of rehearsals that are kind of workshops with the cast and encouraging them to ad lib around it and dirty it up. And then we do that on set. So, which is great, but it's very exhausting because it means everyone is always on. You know, the camera is always on them at any point, even if they walk away their mic is on and so they're always on they're not saving themselves for the big close-up or anything like that we just don't do that um, and we're always changing things at the last minute so it can be a very frantic uh, potentially a very uh, nervous time on the set so I think my job once we get to that point is to is to keep it happy mm -hmm. <laughs> because mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're expecting lots of funny people to be funny naturally there can't be any tension so that's that's what I do on set really Jenji, your eyes bulged a little bit when I asked that question. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was a look of horror or what? But, uh... No, I, I mean, the truth is, you know, we shoot in New York mm -hmm. and I live in LA. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm elusive. <laughs> uh, I go for first and last and I pop in. Um, but I love the distance because I think. It, I'm a little scary uh -huh. for them, and that's always good. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so. scary to like, oh, she's here. <laughs> One of the things that, that's happened, and it certainly happens as these shows go on year after year, is, is actors oftentimes want to move on. They have another job. They want to see what else is out there. Fuck Josh Charles. <laughs> I'm so upset about that. God damn it. I love that, Carrie. It was a oh, I was sorry. screaming at the TV Sunday night. What so are you doing? Upset. I'm so upset still. Like, I can't take it, and I already have a call into his agent. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, I just like, I'm going to keep him alive somehow. His character, just move his character I'm, over. Seriously, <laughs> I couldn't believe that. And how did they get away with it? A year. They kept, kept it a secret. secret for an entire how? Year. Yeah, no, it was amazing. That was crazy. Yeah, no. I'm I, still really I emailed, traumatized. I emailed Baranski the next day and went, what are you doing? <laughs> you can't go Game of Thrones on The I Good know. Wife. <laughs> Everyone's so into killing people now. I hate it. You know, it's a, there's a reason for it, though. The reason is, I've said this before, but the reason is to me is the only thing that we have left in this world where there's a million choices and people can turn anywhere is surprise. That's all we have. It's the only weapon we have because if you make a comedy show, even if it's a good comedy show, there's a lot of other good comedy shows that are out there. That, and if so, if you do, if you but have that, that show bad had such meal, substance that it didn't yeah, matter. No, it people did, didn't but, have to. But in order get to shot. keep people, <laughs> in order to keep people coming back, like episode after episode, year after year, they have to. You have to give them a sense that crazy things can happen. That's why I believe Game of Thrones is the giant hit. It is is because. The, of the, what happened at the end of season one, the main character, and it made it feel like anything can happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, that's what I think the good wife thing was. You Wait, know? that's a spoiler, right? It's been I'm just years. kidding, I'm kidding. I think if it's aired, you can say whatever you want like on Twitter. I think it's like a week. I think it's like a week. If you I don't know. Someone week. was complaining to me about writing a very vague thing about House of Cards, and it has been on Netflix for like two months, and I was like, no, now you're just not watching it. Yeah. Like, that doesn't count as a spoiler. But uh, killing people isn't that getting more predictable in a way now, if that's, the, that's a trend for the last 12 that months. One. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I maybe can't maybe. kill did anybody. I not see that coming. <laughs> no. when, you, when, you're when you're operating at the budget we were operating at, you can't even have an ensemble cast, even. So You can't afford the fake blood, is what you're saying. Well, you can't, well, you can't afford to even have... It, it was, that, that was the trickiest thing about doing it, because you, know, you can get someone from maybe four episodes, and you know, they play an important character, but you had, to, you had to tear the episode so it feels like there's this unity to it. Um, but like for me, the struggle was really not about where, whether people are going to move on. It's whether, you know, is there any way if we turn the entire schedule around, we can get Ray Romano for a day? You know, is there any way that, you know, it, like the, the sort of rotating, you know, casting the show with people as podcast guests playing themselves or whatever. You know, we had Sally, Sally Kellerman as my mother and Judd Hirsch, but I would have liked to have done a couple episodes with Judd Hirsch, but we only had him for a day because that was the way it worked. So this, this problem is, is far from my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> but that conversation, so when you have these stars that come to you and say, and, and sometimes they ultimately aren't able to, sometimes they are, but they say, I want to move on. How do you guys handle that? I take it personally. I feel yeah. sad. And uh, I mean, I want them to move on and have their their thing, but you know, we have a hard time holding on to our cast because mm -hmm. everyone can't be a series regular. There's too many, so they're all going out for other jobs, and we lose people here and there. And it, I, I'm re I get really sad. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Um, and mm -hmm. I wish them the best, but I think staying where they are would be the best. Right. <laughs> but at least on your show, That's there's an feelings. explanation for why they might yeah. not sure. be there, yeah. which is good. Because yeah, yeah, if it's yeah. like, yeah. <clears throat> if it's just like an office comedy or something, you're on the show. screwed. Example, now we have for example. <laughs> like eight or nine, but the cast is huge, is huge. 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 and um, but they yeah, but we to solitary and right. We constructed the show really to enforce a no asshole policy because yeah. anyone who acts out or displeases the powers that be, furlough, they get out, <laughs> they go to shoe, they go to max, shanked, shanked. Yeah. sure, oh yes. So it was sort of a, it's you like know, lost. There's like. Yeah. Twelve different ways people yeah, can die. Yeah, you want to keep them on their toes. It's, it's a nice thing. To because I worked in the British system where the, the idea of being exclusive to one show just doesn't exist. Right. Because our shows are always, our seasons are only six or, or eight series, episodes. Or series, as you call them, right? Se Series, <laughs> yes. In fact, there's a, isn't there a Simpsons episode where he's raising money for a seventh episode of his favourite British <laughs> show? <laughs> 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 so we don't have that. Issue. I mean, there might be, if you've got a long-running series, there might be a cast member who says, I don't want to do any more as this character. But there isn't that sense of people frustrated that they can't do other things. You know? That's been yeah. our thing, too, on Girls, which is we just don't shoot for that long. You know, yeah. we shoot for the summer. They have the... People can do other things. They can yeah. do other yeah. things. Yeah. I mean, they, they try to leave, for sure. <laughs> Not for permanent, but, like, people go and they make a movie, and so we schedule around them and all of that. But for the most part, it's been... You know, people have enough time to do. And what other about things? negotiations? I mean, you've got talent that's often doing, in certain cases, very high stakes negotiations. How does that impact the set? And what do you do as the leader of that set to sort of keep morale high and uh, and deal with what can be a contentious and emotional time? Duck. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, I mean, how? Duck. Yeah, yeah, you know, you have to. That's not. I don't, we're writers. Yeah, we're we're writers. Affairs. We're not. We're not <laughs> business affairs people. Let the business affairs people do that. Hmm. I mean, I, I think the actors should make as much money as possible. Yeah, yeah. When those German cars start pulling up, I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I know. No, I've done my job. You know. Oh, you bought a house. Great. Oh, you know, great. Fantastic. I, I hope it has. You know, a steam room. It's great. <laughs> it's just Pretty wonderful. Cool. And and make as much money as humanly possible because you know it's. Uh, these people are committing many, many years of their lives to this thing, and if it works, great. But uh, the actual negotiation, no. Another, I mean, flexibility with schedule is another way to do that. By the way, is mm -hmm. you know, if there's, yeah. if there's, you know, if there's people on shows that I've worked on who, when we, when they started on the show, were you know, pretty much unknown, and by the time three, four years later, they're very famous. And so, if you can really? figure out a way <laughs> yeah. to say like, oh, there's a movie opportunity, there's a stand-up tour opportunity, or whatever, and we can help you out there. Like, I mean, our my belief is that the happier the cast is, the better off the show is in every direction. Totally. So it's and like if you can do you, it yeah, in a way it, where it, you're not compromising yeah, the so show. You, yeah, and we've written we write people out of episodes from time to time. Like mm -hmm. if there's a three week thing they want to do, we'll schedule it for like a two week hiatus and let them out of one episode or whatever. It just I mean it's also it's it's silly not to. It's good for your show too. The more your actors are out there being famous, the better off your <laughs> show is. My, mine was driven completely by me making phone calls and asking for favors from friends. I, I, I didn't have we, to. We, we do that, that too. too. Yeah, yeah, it's just sort of yeah. like, hey, what's going on? Like yeah. one, we had written Seth Rogen into a part that was fairly specific. And, and you know, he said he wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it. And, you know, and I'm literally talking to them. And then we went through a few other people and, and, and Dave Cross, who I've known half my life, and he said he would do it. And the script they sent to Dave still had Seth Rogen's name in it. So, <laughs> so Cross... Cross shows up, he's like, I'm reading this, and I see Seth's in it, and your dad, and I'm not clear who I'm supposed to be playing. And, and it was this moment where you he's like... You new casting people. That's horrible. No, but, but because Dave was so funny about it, because he called it out, and he, was not, he wasn't really upset about it, and he did a great job, but I just thought it was hilarious that he's like, oh, I'm Seth Rogen. I, I get it. And, well, he's on IFC, too. He gets it. Yeah. yeah. No, he was, uh, it was a, a hilarious mistake, and Dave was... Uh, Great in it. Uh, I'd like I'd like to know what is the most personal thing you've ever written into one of your shows? Maybe you start with Mike. I'm not telling you that. <laughs> like in a million years, I would not tell you that. I've done a lot of kind of autobiographical stuff. I mean, Office Space was kind of based on me working as an engineer, different cubicle jobs. Um, there's a scene in the in the new series in Silicon Valley that's uh, where he's meeting this billionaire. And it's all P 
people around him kind of talking about him like he's a cult leader. Like, and that's almost word for word a meeting I had with a billionaire before the first dot com bubble burst, where they like, they were like, uh, uh, let's call the guy Bill. They said, uh, <laughs> Uh, Bill is uh, running about a half hour late, but he's really excited to meet you. And then they're all, oh, if you met Bill before, oh my God, you're gonna, you're gonna make a character out of him. He's, oh, he's so amazing. And, and then like, you know, okay, he's gonna be another 10 minutes. And then this guy going, I'm the VP of uh, whatever. And I only get to see Bill about once every two weeks. And then, the, and it's only for 10 minutes. And the other guy goes, yeah, but that 10 minutes is incredible. <laughs> And like they're going on like this, and then this guy never shows up at all. And so I mean, uh, the dialogue That's in how the he keeps his show, great yeah. Just, just like, and but it was like it was really like walking into a cult, and that was that's like word for word in the that's in the exactly shows. So, the I don't know if I would call that personal though. I mean, that's just my show is like so autobiographical that I, it strained my relationship with my father like irreparably, and you know it's sort of like was it worth it? And there's part of me that's like, nah, he had it coming. So, uh, they, <laughs> but like the huh? television is vengeance. Yeah, yeah, it is. It can be. Yeah, he 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 watched as much as he could. Uh, and I thought, like, you know, for me, I was like, look, Judd Hirsch played you, and he's arguably a better father. And you know, and uh, but all, that first season, it's all taken from my life. Like, and it really became a, an issue with the woman I was with at that time because the fights were sort of like too really close. And in this season too. I, I, that's the way I choose to do my comedy and the podcast, everything, so I have to honor it. But I've gotten a little more diplomatic and respectful in terms of fictionalizing stuff. Because I, what I think is not going to upset somebody. And ultimately, I did, uh, there was one show last season where I had a guy who I went to college with. Eric Stoltz played this guy that, who became this big director. And that guy, there is a guy in my life like that. But only he's gonna know who it is. He and might it not even know. That's no, like, he okay. emailed me. Oh, he did. Okay. And he's like, "What the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you?" It, like this after right. twenty years, I'm like, "Dude, you're the only guy that knows this." Yeah. And and it was really a fictionalization, but he got really upset. So then your choice is is like, "Well, how important are these people in my life?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You hadn't talked to her for twenty. Years. Years. <laughs> no, but like almost everything yeah. we write is personal. Right. I mean, I have had no one recognize, including the people very, very close to me, who I've had the exact dialogue with. I've had almost no one recognize anything. It's like pretty the, incredible. Like lots of people getting it wrong. Like ton, tons of people thought they were butthead that I grew up with. <laughs> I, I honestly like, <laughs> and, and teachers thought they were the hippie teacher that, that weren't. And, uh, and then the people, like there's one guy who I actually really I was trying to draw when I drew Beavis. Beavis and Butthead were two attempts to draw the same guy that kind of went different directions. <laughs> that guy's a nuclear engineer. He has no idea. Like, but he but the pe now. but I keep hearing. Well, <laughs> there were at least three guys from my high school that became nuclear engineers. Actually, so, so yeah. where did you grow up? Same Albuquerque. We grew up in Albuquerque. Mark grew up in. <laughs> was that Albuquerque, Albuquerque High though? Right? Was that like most? Yeah, of the and then St. Pius right, yeah, right. transferred to the to the private school, but but like I get, none of the people that I ever really based something on, I don't think I've ever said, hey, that's me. It's weird. Well, yeah, I tried, my dad's name's Barry and the character's Larry, so I really tried to <laughs> yeah. make it. We got, we got like a whole legal lecture from HBO our first season because we were just naming everyone their own name. Oh, wow. <laughs> Or like, or the actor's name. Mm -hmm. So it was like, they all, Marnie was named Audrey, who was the character she was based, and they had to be like, please change the names. Like just, we're begging you. Lawsuits, have, they ruined so, like the fear of lawsuits ruins so much on, like even on the level that you know, we're working at. Like you can't, you gotta be careful of everything. You can't do anything. Yeah. You'll get calls from legal. There's a Steve in Napa Valley. Yeah. <laughs> Can you change the name of the character? Yeah. Mm. You know? It's crazy. I still don't understand. It's like, I guess, I guess they look for names that there's a ton of, or I don't even understand yeah. it. They'll, it either they're, they're has like, to be oh, one or a million. No, it has to be right? none or more than none three or, or a million, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what Jenny say a lot of, like Celia and Weed said things that my that came out of my mother's mouth, and she had no recognition. But I'd get these phone calls like, "Why are you so mean to this character? She's just <laughs> trying to do the right thing." It's just like total disconnect. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my mother doesn't. My mother seems to be able to absorb it because Kellerman is playing my mother. They, I mean, the the personality and everything. 
but my mother seems to be vain enough to be flattered by it as opposed to seeing it as some sort of you know character like a, a bad thing she's like oh it's fine i love her I'm like, okay <laughs> I had a question for Armando. Um, you talked about kind of the differences between working in the UK, and working here. What's been the most striking, I guess, difference in creating a TV show for? I mean, you work in London, obviously, yeah. a lot too. But... Yeah, we do for for feet, but all the writers are based in the UK. The directors are, and we cut it in the UK. The cast come over to London to rehearse and so on. So it I, it's actually, I mean, working with HBO reminds me a lot of working with the BBC mm. ten years ago, where it was very much hands off. We just want you to make it as best you can be. So I think I've had a very um, privileged <laughs> experience of American TV, really, with working with HBO. And how, how are you able to tap into the, <laughs> the American, I mean, what I perceive as being quite an accurate portrayal of American politics? And well, how just are a you lot of research, just, just going through to DC. And I mean, they are star fuckers in, in, in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Did, just like Hollywood. Reggie Love, uh, Obama's assistant, showed us around the West Wing. And he said, this is the Roosevelt Room. This would be where Josh and CJ wow. would be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but why don't you say this is where Barack Obama <laughs> and Vladimir Putin... Why, why yeah. are you referencing a TV show? Because they love, they love it. They love the... So, you know, and if you ring up and saying we're making a TV show about you and we're HBO, they're, they're going to be, yeah, come in. <laughs> so we did an awful lot of that. They, they literally let us measure the drapes and... Get in, and so we. You could almost do a... wish they weren't so open about it. In I know, it's quite. Um, it's quite. Well, I did this. Thi I did a film set in Washington called In the Loop, and um, I love that. Oh, the, oh, and this was about eight, about four or five years ago, and I said I want to go into the State Department to see what it looks like, and this journalist said, uh, "Oh, just go up to the front desk and say, I'm Andy Nucci, BBC. I'm here for the twelve thirty. <laughs> Fine, okay. And my and my assistant, who was about twenty-one, so that my, me and this boy just went up to the front of the State Department, said, "BBC here for the twelve thirty. And they went, "Oh yeah, it's through there." And we were in the State Department, and we we're <laughs> wandering around. I had a little BBC pass, which was basically just my photo with my name on it, which you know a three-year-old could have printed off. And we were wandering around the State Department, and with no one accompanying us. And I thought, well. I want to get some pictures to bring back to the art department. So I was taking photos. <laughs> and, and then this huge guy took, turned up and said, excuse me, and I said, I'm here for the 12.30? And he went, oh, it's just down there. And <laughs> we went, and so actually this eye opened. I this is terrifying. <laughs> You're the world's yeah. greatest spy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, and then and Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State at the time, and this came up at one of her press briefings, and she said, uh, oh, I'm sure that didn't happen. And then they did a report, and it did. So then they re-evaluated uh, security at the State Department. You're on a watch so list now, right? I, I can't get out of this country. <laughs> <laughs> and now you just um, say I'm here for between two ferns, yeah. and then they let yeah. you. They let but you. I think, to go back to the question about what's the difference, um, it's just that air of, you know, in, in the UK, the resources are, you know, the budgets are smaller. So you have to sort of improvise. You have to get away with, you know, you have to try and get around the rules and so on. So there's a bit of that that goes on. Uh, I, so the only difference I've noticed really is the you know, the, the resources we have to play with on Veep. You know, she's vice president, so if she goes into her room, there's 100 people there, not 12. And I kind of enjoy that. I enjoy the, the bigger stage mm -hmm. to sure. play with, yeah. What's the worst writing gig you guys have had? I think any paid writing gig is pretty good. <laughs> I mean, just compared to other gigs. Like, I sold cigars in college. So, most writing jobs are pretty great after that. Cigars, yeah. yeah, yeah. I wrote the Surgeon General's warnings for the cigars that Jenny <laughs> saw. It was great, it was terrible. And maybe not necessarily a TV job, it could be any writing job. I, I haven't had a bad one. I got super You've been lucky. Very spoiled, Mike. I have been. Started at SNL and then decided to move to LA. Greg Daniels was, was transitioning out of King of the Hill onto the office, hired me at the office. And he and I developed Parks and Rec together, and I've been there since. So I slalomed through a lot of um, Hollywood obstacles, I think. But I think even the worst jobs in writing are yeah. still the best jobs. Like, you still, I've been on shows that I didn't love being on where, you know, there were not kind people working there or inexperienced people or anything. And it's like you still 
learn a ton and you're still sitting in a room with some pretty fucking funny people it's all day long. It's a it's ridiculous like, job. It it's is like a, a ridiculously it's... lucky job. Yeah. And, and so almost, you know, even though there were times at two in the morning where I'd go, I wish I was going home, I still was going. If you can't home, be home, you... then being in a room full of funny people yeah. is not yeah. bad. Although people often say that the drama writing rooms are often happier places than <laughs> comedy writers' rooms. There's some seriously dysfunctional rooms that can destroy your soul. There's no question <laughs> about it. And, and yeah, you try not to recreate them. Uh -huh. There's usually a lot of snacks, from what I know, uh -huh. that, which is uh -huh. good. <laughs> my only experience is writing on my show, and that's been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Chuck? You've been you've been in a few. I can't answer that question until I retire. <laughs> and write your book. And that's coming soon anyway. <laughs> that's kind of what I was thinking. <laughs> Chuck, I do you have a vanity card that is so incendiary you've not been able to uh, get it through? So incendiary that it's not. You know, um, at a certain point, I realized that uh, I was just like. I was just lighting matches with those things and, you know, and putting them down my pants. It was ridiculous. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I pulled way back. I pulled way back on the... Uh, I know what they're going to censor before I send them over to CBS and Warners and Legal and stuff like that. I know their problems. So, mm -hmm. you know, I've been doing it now for 18 years, 19 years. So um, it's, it's, you know, I, it's, their, it's their bat and their ball. It's their, you know, so... That one second of screen time, uh, I, I pretty much understand the parameters. And if I know in advance they're not going to uh, air it, I, I, I'll put the censored card up, uh, and, then, and then it crashes the website. Uh, <laughs> you know, because people want it, you know, so. Yeah, so. Do you send them in batches, or do you send them literally one by no, one? No, I usually write them on the bus to school. I mean, <laughs> just you know, the last thing in the world you want to do, you know, yeah, is, is then like, write a little. He made more work for himself. And, and, no, I know, and I, so you know, I, what have I done? Yeah, and, and then it kind of becomes this thing that you kind of feel obligated, because people come up to you and say, oh, I read those, and they're funny, and you go, oh, I'll, I'll keep doing it. <laughs> I don't want to, but, but it is fun. It's fun to write something that has nothing to do with anything. Uh -huh. you know. And it's a lot of pausing on the DVRs on uh, Monday nights. Well, I started it with VHS stuff, so it wobbled. You couldn't read them at all, so I got away with murder. You couldn't read them for four or five years till, till TiVo came along. They were basically just letters jumbling around on the screen. Imagine what you wrote then. Yeah. That is crazy, though. Now, that's a thing where in the old days, pre-HD, if you had a, if a character on a show held up like a list of something or if you cut to like a board with a bunch of writing on it you no one cared what right. you wrote and right. now you have to make those things jokes yeah. second is you have infinite, to like yes. yeah, yeah like second is forever the, yeah. every yeah. single time there's a shot of any collection of writing or like we did a episode of parks and rec where leslie nope was running a an ad like a, a an election ad because she was running for office and the joke was that she said, I'm pro this, and I'm pro this, and I'm pro this, and here are some other things I'm pro, and then a crazy scroll of like 150 things went up the screen. And I was, and we wrote that joke, and we knew it was going to be funny, and, but then I was like, God damn it, i got to write that now. I can't, you, people are going to go one by one, and they did, and, and 30 seconds after the episode aired, there was a list of here are all the things that she's pro. And they had to be jokes. I mean, some of them were just like whatever, normal stuff, but we had to write like 100 jokes because you know that people are going to actually... Pay, I mean, it's great that people care, right. pay attention, but... They take that upon themselves. It's always fascinating to me. Who does that? Who's like, I got Fans an hour. of the show, that's yeah. why you... I, that's the obligation is, like, I people I, care. I, I ran that last line of dialogue on True Detective over and over oh again because I couldn't understand what McConaughey said yeah. Yeah. when they were walking away. Ten and then I went online going, what did he say? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I couldn't hear that last yeah. line. Did you and find I, out? You know, uh, you somebody find finally told me yeah. kind of what he said. So you know, no one knew. But, but it, it kind of like, you know, it I, was some like... Some friends subtitled it so you could actually see oh, the really? words on screen. Oh, uh, really? We just yeah. gave up. We, we went on it like four times. You couldn't hear it. was like, no. Exactly. And, and I'm yeah, like, I want to know what this like, is. Whatever. I, I really want to know what yeah. this yeah. is. You know, I didn't care anymore. It's like, you lost me. He said, sounds like the light is winning. Sounds like, yes, something like that. Yeah, I went, okay, cool. I'm happy now. But we really had to work for it. I was very happy, yeah. that was a real moment. Yeah, no, it was an important Well, that's something you have to work for in life. That's true. <laughs> I'm actually curious, what's the last thing that you either watched on TV that made me made you laugh out loud or something that you watched that made you jealous that you didn't create it? I just I watched this web series that I really liked called High Maintenance, 
Juice, have you seen those? Oh, yeah. They're just little jewels. Uh, it's basically about this uh, pot delivery guy in New York who's who's guileless, and he's just called the guy. But it, he's just the connective tissue, and it's these tiny little episodes about the customers. And you get these beautiful glimpses into people's lives. I just think it was it's well-crafted, well-cast, and just... They were really nice, and I had insomnia, and I watched the entire season uh, when I wrote them a fan letter because I, it was just delicious. It's like they're out there making it. It's on Vimeo, and um, I thought they were just these little gems. I laugh out loud at basically anything Chelsea Peretti says <laughs> on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah. Nothing makes me happier. Yeah, she's a, she's a true weirdo. <laughs> yeah, I love in it. In the best possible I way. I love it. And I, I get jealous of Genji's casting. <laughs> we have the same casting person, so it's like an actual well, personal jealousy. <laughs> I know. I mostly get jealous of dramas. I don't know if anybody else has that. It's all yeah. yeah. Yeah, I get every time Raylan Gibbons says anything on Justified, I'm like, God damn it, that's a great, great. line. Yeah. He's the coolest. He's guy. the coolest He's dude the coolest ever. Guy. Like, yeah, like yeah. And even like the episodes. You know, that show is so. Um, there's so many characters, and the plots are so threaded and stuff that sometimes the, an individual episode won't be like amazing. But within that episode, there's eight moments where he like he. I, I, there, I read a thing with him where they, a reporter said like. How do you play a scene differently if like you've been shot or injured as opposed to if you haven't been? And he said, all I do is talk a little slower. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's the coolest thing ever. Like he doesn't change and it, he was shot and I won't, the spoiler alert, he was shot in an episode a while ago. And I was watching him and he literally didn't change a thing about the way he played the scene. It was exact, he's bleeding from his stomach and he just kept being the same guy. And I was like, that's, that's the Elmore coolest Leonard character. Too, and that was yeah. Funny. Yeah, they really the captured Elmore Leonard on They the really did. Yeah. Bad guys are hilarious. Bad guys are hilarious. Yeah. The main guy is the coolest dude ever. Yeah. Pulls off a cowboy hat in 2014 yeah. somehow. <laughs> like, that's fantastic. But that's where I, um, I'm jealous of drama generally because whenever I watch a you know, beautifully shot drama and you know, a car pulls up in the music and you see the foot, you know, feet getting out on the floor and going up some steps and it's 30 Take seconds. Yeah. And I just think, we I'd cut, cut that, that, man, we don't have time. <laughs> nothing funny. You know, it's that yeah. pressure to make every moment count in a humorous way. We wouldn't even go outside. We wouldn't, oh no, go outside? Yeah. Yeah. Oh no. David Chase used to say, <laughs> I remember David Chase saying that the first thing the, like a big thing with him was that he wanted to always show cars pulling into driveways because that was like a key to him, a key element of storytelling is how yeah. a person got. And he'd shoot it up another. like he sometimes. He'd oh, come. it was so great. When and I first got my show, like we were trying to figure out what to call it, and I suggested, how about we call it Not Louie? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I used to do that on stage, you know, and him and I are friends, but like it, it's not a jealousy thing, but it's just, it's very interesting to me that. You know, there's this need to to compare you know everything against what's popular and to sort of like deconstruct it like that, where their lives are so different. And I don't like that weird viciousness of everything being plotted as a as a competition, especially against against people, because you know I love him, I love his show. But Breaking Bad for me was really uh, the most satisfying thing I'd watched on television in a long time. Like I, I don't watch a lot of stuff. I don't know where people have the time. But like that thing, like I, I was so happy it ended that with a. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it. Still but in no, but three. I felt like there Still was in season three. I felt like there was oh, real you closure. Do, you know what I mean? Like I was satisfied with the ending. It's so rare it also that. Also ended so just well at the right time. Right. Beautifully yeah. done. Yeah. A, tra Beautiful. a train episode that year. Oh God, amazing. You can't see feature films that. Me, good. And they, mean, they did a lot of what you like. Is that like yeah. the the time and the, sh the construction of shots and the I stuff. Should. Like not a, it's it's well, they amazing. The best, they the best DP in the world. On that it was show. amazing. Like, cause I like, like just doing my show. Like, you got to cut to service the joke and service the story and and to like you don't. Uh, and I'm like I'm a novice at it, but you can't. Like, I always wonder. Like, well, how do you get these long? Wait, how? Do, why can't we just make it like that? We got a good camera. Yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of skill to it. There is that profound. thing also. How are people watching? Because you know all these, especially the dramas, they, they have a more cinematic quality to them, and yet. People are watching them on right. smaller and smaller, you know, or bending down, or you know, on the lap. And I got onto a plane the other day, and the, there was a kid watching the movie Pacific Rim on his iPhone. <laughs> oh, come on! I saw that. Yeah, three gigantic. In the theater yeah, that was made for on an iPhone. Like the robots are like <laughs> Legos. <laughs> so crazy. But only part of the screen because he was playing Angry Birds or whatever. <laughs> yeah. He was texting at the he's same time. Do, he's yeah. got a double.
Right. No, I never get jealous of dramas because I feel like with a gun to my head, I could not write a drama. Like, I, 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 a lot of times with comedy, I can see things coming, which doesn't actually, like, limit the enjoyment at all sometimes. That's part of it. But dramas, I mean, like, forget The Good Wife, but, like, I'm always like, what? <laughs> I can't, like, I just am so unfamiliar with those structures. And so I admire it so much when people are crafting those stories. Like, the best ones are like, you know, Top of the Lake and also just like watching the Americans. I'm like, yeah. how long have they been plotting that? Yeah, like, no, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's and Michael it's so Mondale fun. Too. Isn't it just yeah. like fun and funny too? Like, it's got this level of mm -hmm. camp, I don't know. I love it. I do not think I could ever do it, so jealousy seems ridiculous, but... It is fun to go home and watch something that has nothing to do with what you do right. all day. Yeah. I, you know, I just, you know, I, the, only, the only time I watch something to laugh is Stuart, John Stewart. Mm -hmm. I know every night he's going to make me laugh mm -hmm. out loud, mm -hmm. and uh, he's just, to me, he's, he's, uh, he's my touchstone. He's my Johnny Carson these days, you know? Sure. Let's end on a funny one, which is if you could do a crossover with a, whether it's a show you guys just mentioned or it's something else with your show. Is there a character that you would want from another show to come into your show? What would that be? <laughs> do two and a half girls. <laughs> House of Cards. Yeah. Well, some CBS didn't have a problem with the cum shot. Not gonna be me. We do actually do an episode in this coming series when they they go to Silicon Valley. Oh really? So the whole episode set in Silicon Valley, and it's going to be on after you. So oh, it'll be interesting to see what that. Have, uh, <laughs> you should have gone to Washington. <laughs> <Yeah>. or something. <laughs> HBO Are you didn't getting? Tell uh, you guys that that was happening. Don't yeah, tell me did. Zuckerberg's did doing your show. Is he? Uh, <laughs> you no. Know, did you get any cameos from <laughs> Silicon? Uh, <laughs> Louis, and, Louis, Louis and I did. He like, he he had me on last season as me. In your house, right? Or it house was supposedly like, in my yeah, house. Yeah. It was an apartment. But like, what he's so done? Funny. It, God, it, that was so I funny. That made that. me laugh. But it's so, so bizarre because we did that podcast where you know, like, he basically called me out, you know, for being a shitty friend, yeah. and and it was it was great. But now he <laughs> he's great. it yeah. is yeah. it's two parts, but and he, it's the best. He 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 cast me as his side of it, and he did it again this season where where i i'm literally saying the stuff to him that he said to me on on my podcast How and therapeutic it, it sort of <laughs> is it's, it's sort of hilarious i'd like him to, to to do my show but like you know our, it's it's you know when it, louis sort of like uh, it's, um, he's not gonna he's not gonna do it <laughs> but uh you know maybe not because he doesn't want to but there's he's he seems to have a very large life uh -huh. and, and, and he did uh, mike show he did. I'm just saying. It was right what, the cop? <laughs> he, did the Parks cop? And, he did Parks and Rec right, right, when, his, right when he was selling Louie. Yeah, no, it was and, great. And I was like, what, so what's this new show you're doing? And he was like, well, they're going to give me a certain amount of money, and the next time we talk will be when I send them the pilot. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. That's insane. And he was like, no, that's the deal. I told him I will not speak with them <laughs> until I send them. And that's what he did. And then, he sent, and then like the next time he was on, they had bought the show, and, he, and I was like, so you know, what's it like? And he's like, I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. Like they, they were literally like wiring money into his personal bank account, and he was going out and he could hire. They, it was amazing. He's a very brilliant guy. He, he, he I'd want him to play himself. So yeah, maybe he'll do it. You know, it's just a time. That's thing. a wonderful story. It really is. Isn't yeah, I mean, and kids? they, and they, had, they had chased him too. Like they had chased him. They tried him. to get him to do stuff, and then he was like, "Here are the terms." And they, and to John Landgraf's credit, and everybody that facts, yeah. they were like. There you go. No, it worked so well, that model, and you'd think someone would go, let's do that for other people. No, you wouldn't, because <laughs> no one else is him. That's no, well, that's, well, that's like, true, but it's gotta be the guy that good. But it cuts both ways, be. though, because he, it's weird, because he did it, so there was a lot of people saying, like, I want that deal, but then there were executives saying, like, well, if Louie could do it for that much money, you know, yeah. you, you know oh, what I mean? Oh, does he do it well, real he put, low budget? Isn't there like a helicopter in the pilot? I think. Yeah, he like, spent a lot of money. Like, on it. He, he makes he makes very interesting choices. Yes, like when with he, the money. Where he yeah. yeah, because he's like, I need to destroy a car yeah. for this joke. Right. He's like Buster Keaton in the General. You know, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. we got one shot at that bridge. He's, and he, you know, and he'll do it. Right. It's it's fascinating because uh, that's how he'll budget it. Like I spent a lot of money on that. Yeah. He went to China, I think, for yeah. one shot. Yeah. Yeah. And again, didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Did, literally didn't he tell just, anyone. He, was, he like got a permit. He shoots with a really small crew too, like it, which is you know rare. Yeah. Like there's like ten people on that set. Well, he take. I mean, he's thirty minutes and he takes the time. We try to do it a little bit too, but that time that you're talking about, like the the Pause. giving yeah. things a breath and yeah. and he'll go not just for like sometimes 
we all, I'm sure, do the thing where you go too long with something is the joke, but he also will do it kind of just for the temp of the scene, I Yeah, think. and I think because he got more confident as an actor and he yeah. could let his emotions dictate things, it, right. he did it more. That's why we, we gather here today, to celebrate Louis C.K., right? <laughs> That's Great. That's how rare. Here's to Louis. That, Ladies and gentlemen. Of, we could do worse this morning, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm, I think we could talk all day, and unfortunately we can't, but we really appreciate your time. Thank you. And thank, you. Yeah. thank you so much. I can talk all day. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I had to pee a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much.